Well, a quiet has descended, so I will take advantage of that. Uh, there are still a handful of seats available, um, so please occupy them if you're standing at the back. So good evening, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to see such a full house. Typically when we, uh, you know, offer free speeches, about, we have about 50% turnout, but this seems to be 100%, so I think that's indicative of the uh, appeal of this talk. Uh, this promises to be an interesting and, judging by the emails I've been getting, rather lively evening, okay? So, um, who am I? I'm Gail McElroy, I'm head of the School of Social Sciences, which is jointly hosting this event with uh, Trinity Research in the Social Sciences. Um, as I've said, we've never witnessed such kind of interest in any of our public outreach events, and um, I suppose it speaks to the topicality of tonight's event. We're, there's no denying that we're living in interesting times. Um, many of us face the news with fear and trepidation every day. I'm kind of obliged, it's kind of a professional hazard to read the news, but uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to stomach. One school of thought thinks that liberal values are under threat as never before since perhaps the 1930s. You know, and many of you will have read the manifesto by public intellectuals published in La Liberation and The Guardian and the Irish Times on Friday. And, you know, you might be given to thinking that if you look at Brexit, the Gilets Jaunes, the rise of populist movements across Europe. But another school of thought thinks we've never had it so good. You know, the kind of philosopher Steve Pinker actually personifies this best. You know, we're living longer, we're happier, there are more democracies in the world, and we're definitely more prosperous. So it all depends on kind of your historical perspective. Tonight we're going to focus on questions of nationalism and secessionism in Europe. Over the course of the next 90 minutes, we're going to have some very interesting talks. And again, there are alternative views on this. You can take a pessimistic or an optimistic view. Do these movements pose a threat to our economic and democratic stability, or are they to be welcomed as an expression of human self-determination? Is it progress or is it regression? So nationalism is obviously a question with which we're very familiar on this island. And tonight we're going to look at Catalan nationalism, but I'd like you to bear in mind that there are many secessionist movements that exist in a surprising number of European countries at the moment. Flanders, Wallonia, um, Scotland perhaps, Northern Ireland of course, whether that's secessionist or not is debatable, Lombardy and Venice. And our other speakers will actually shed some light on these and give a historical perspective. Just some housekeeping issues before we get started. Um, under GDPR rules, I'm bound to tell you that this is being um, recorded as a podcast, and there are also film crew, crews here from RTE and a Spanish um, agency. So if you don't want to be caught in sound or on video, now's your time to leave. Which, <laughs> good luck if you're in the middle there somewhere. Um, but anyway, uh, it's quite dark. Uh, the fire exits are the doors you came in. There are four, but there are also fire exits at the back, which everyone forgets about, so you can exit at the back. Um, it's highly unlikely. Uh, we'll be using them. On a serious note, just before I hand over to Mr. Pougemont, I'd like to remind you that universities are places of free speech, and they're where difficult conversations should be taking place. So I'd like tonight's conversation to kind of proceed in a civilized and respectful fashion. Judging by the entrance, it seems there are a large number of supporters of um, Carlos Pougemont here this evening, but there are others who will disagree with them, and they are also very, very welcome. This is a divisive topic for many of the Spaniards in the audience, um, and um, I hope we can all listen and deliberate in a respectful fashion. So please, when all of the speakers are speaking, no interruptions. You know, um, this isn't the House of Commons. I am not John Burka, okay? Um, and so, but after the speakers have finished speaking, we will have plenty of time for questions and answers. And um, you can then challenge Mr. Pouchemont as you wish, and indeed, I'd like you to include the other speakers as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Pouchemont. Um, he started his professional career as a journalist at the uh, newspaper El Pont, uh, where he became editor-in-chief, and he also served as the general director of Catalonia Today, a daily newspaper in English, which he helped launch. He's been politically active since November 2006, when he was elected as a member of the Parliament of Catalonia for the Girona region. In 2011, he was elected as mayor of Girona and re-elected in 2015. On January 12, 2016, he was officially sworn in as the 130th president of Catalonia. 
Of course, to most of us here in Ireland, he is better known as the author of the, um, depending on your viewpoint, um, brave or controversial um, Catalan independence referendum. Tonight, Mr. Puigdemont will discuss the present political situation in Catalonia and the right to self-determination in Europe and what he sees as the future for his independent movement. With that, I'll hand over to him. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you, Trinity College Dublin, for your invitation and all of you for attending. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize because I'm not a fluent English speaker, so I, I will try to do the best of me for, in order to be understood uh, all that the things I want to share with you. Um, it is likely that some or maybe many of you are uh, wondering uh, why a large number of Catalans no longer want to be part of Spain. The answer, or one of the answers, might be because Catalonia is a nation, an old European nation with its own identity, culture, and language, a nation that has had its own institution for centuries. For example, I am 130th president of an institution that dates back to the 1359, and a nation that has always wanted to have the status as a such. But this only offers an explanation in terms of a classic 19th or 20th century nationalist emancipation process. We are now in the 21st century, and Catalonia's situation needs to be understood in terms of democratic radicalism removed from the concept of nationalist movement. The purpose of my speech is to explain the dynamics of our political, democratic, and profoundly pro-European process with the firm unwavering desire to pursue it all all times through dialogue and negotiation. Since the death of the dictator Francisco Franco in 1975, Catalonia has contributed more than many to the consolidation of a Spanish democracy. Catalonia has been the economic driving force for Spain and a factor in its modernization. Most Catalan believed the Spanish constitution of 1978 to be a good starting point for ensuring Catalonia's self-government and material progress. And confident of this, Catalonia involved itself fully in bringing Spain back into the European and international institution after 40 years of marginalization. However, over the years, it has become evident that the Spanish constitutional system has not only stopped evolving in the direction desired by the Catalan people, but has also started to, reg to regress, to work against Catalonia. Given the situation, in 2005, 88% of the members of the Parliament of Catalonia, 88%, following the procedures established by the Spanish Constitution, based the proposal for a new statute of autonomy and sent it to the Spanish Parliament, where it was again approved after some modifications. In fact, the, the text finally put to a referendum in 2006 was different from the one initially proposed by the Catalan Parliament, yet it was still accepted by the majority of citizens who voted. In total, of 37%, uh, 47% 47 of the electorate took part and around 1.9 million voted in favor of the statute. Notably, this was 145 fewer than those who voted for independence in the referendum of self-determination held in October 1st, 2017, which I will return to a little later. In 2010, 
four years after the statute had come into force, a constitutional court consisting of magistrates chosen by the two main Spanish parties, the Socialist Parties, the Socialist Party and the People's Party, issued a shocking sentence that restricted the statute and modified the content that had received public backing in the referendum. Even worse, after that sentence, Spanish political powers not only failed to take steps to repair the damage, but initiated an aggressive and systematic process of recentralization. This has led to the continual suspension or elimination of Catalan competences through decrees, laws, and sentences, neglect and lack of investment in basic infrastructures in Catalonia, a key element in the country's economic crisis. All this has led millions of Catalans to reach the conclusion that the only way to guarantee the survival of our values as a society is for Catalonia to become an independent state. The results of the elections to the Parliament of Catalonia in 2015, with a political majority in favor of Catalan independence, corroborated this. And as well as those in favor of independence, an even greater majority, near 80% of Catalan society, support the idea that whatever Catalonia's future was to be, it should be decided democratically and peacefully by Catalans in a referendum, which we consider to be the most helpful tool of the 21st century democracies. With the aim of facilitating this referendum, Catalan political institutions made a number of proposals for a dialogue to the Spanish government and institutions. In April 2014, Delegates of the majority in the Catalan Parliament asked the Spanish Parliament to agree on a public consultation, a non-binding public consultation. The response was that the matter could not be locked into the future. Not only was it off the table for debate, it could not even be spoken about. Eighteen times, I repeat, on eighteen occasions, in a variety of formats and place, we try to establish political dialogue to agree the terms of a referendum, as was held, for example, in Scotland on September 11th, 2014, a referendum whose date and questions are agreed upon by both parties, in which everyone has the chance to campaign and present their arguments, and in which both parties agree to accept and apply the result through negotiation that projects their respective interest. In the United Kingdom, if the United Kingdom could do this, why not Spain? But the Spanish response to Catalan demands was, has always been no. No to everything. No to dialogue. No to negotiation. Not to reaching a democratic solution. Given the refusal and obeying the mandate given to us by the majority of Catalan citizens, the government of Catalonia, which it was my honor to preside, called a referendum on self-determination on October 1st, 2017, with the legal backing of the Parliament of Catalonia. We did so while observing the basic principles of universal rights. The referendum was held, as you know, you know, under extreme conditions unacceptable in the European Union on the 21st century. Unfortunately, on October 1st, 2017, we endured the rage of a Spain that wants to silence our voice. It was the first time in the history of European democracies, of Euro modern European democracies, that an election was held aimed violent police attacks against voters looking to cast their ballot. And the Spanish police hit defenseless members of the public and emergency services attended over a thousand people. 
The aim was not just to confiscate ballot boxes and ballot slips. The aim was to make people give up their right to vote. But this ignominious act backfired on the politicians responsible for it. Over 2.4 million citizens overcame their fear and went out to vote. We don't know how many tried to do so unsuccessfully, but we, don't, we do know the polling stations that were violently closed represented a further 770,000 voters. As you know, the vote in favor of independence won the referendum under the blows of policy buttons. The ballot boxes, the language we Democrats understand, said yes to independence. And this is the route I'm committed to following. Unfortunately, the Spanish state has followed another. Once again, it is a route that harms the rights and freedoms of Catalans. Today, democracy in Spain is at risk because basic rights have been de facto suspended. And this represents a major threat to all Catalans and Spanish citizens, as well as to the European Union. Today, an European Union member state cannot guarantee the judicial rights of its citizens, given that in recent months, Spain has contravened international treaties ratified by the Spanish state itself, such, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. This is not a mere internal Spanish affair. It is a European problem. Legal action taken by Spain against our democratic movement has led to the imprisonment of the vice president of the government of Catalonia, five ministers, the president of the parliament of Catalonia, and two leaders of our country's most important civil association. This is not an example of full democracy. It has also led to the exile of four ministers, two members of the Parliament of Catalonia and myself, the President of the Government of Catalonia. We have all been accused of crimes of rebellion and sedition and are facing prison sentences of up to 25 years, which is comparable to what an armed military uprising would have to endure. This is an outrageous contradiction, as you, will, as you will find that no violent demonstration or action has been carried out by the people being persecuted. Quite the opposite. We reject violence in all, uh, in all its forms. Beyond imprisonment and forced exile, a campaign that can only be described as judicial harassment is being carried out against over 700 Catalan mayors, public officials, social institutions, media, business, schools, artists, and activists. This wave of repression is unbecoming of a nation that claims to be a constitutional democracy. A lack in the separation, in the separation of powers gave way to a perfect storm that Spain used to crashly, illegal, illegally, and illegitimately just uh, intervening Catalonia's institutions of self-government for months, justifying such actions on the grounds of the Article 155 of the Spanish Constitution. This Constitution was approved 40 years ago under the impending threat of the army, and it is now out of date and obsolete. I would like, I would like once again to state that the Catalan proposal is profoundly pro-European. First of all, because Catalonia wishes to become a new fully-fledged state in the European Union under the rules of the European Union. One of the founding values of political Catalan movement since its origin over 100 years ago is it Europeanism. Indeed, Catalonia in general has a clear desire to be part of the European project as we feel profoundly involved in it. Europe has seen, has seen new states arise in recent decades. Unlike 
unlike other cases not so long ago, Catalonia aspires to achieve independence peacefully, civically, using democrat democracy as its only weapon. In Catalonia, we wish to exercise our full sovereignty in order to share it with our European partners in areas where we are stronger together. We firmly believe in the common European project and we are convinced that we have a future together. Our common history and culture make us stronger and more prosperous and Catalonia wants to play its part. We have always been an hospitable land, a confluence of cultures. For example, 70% of the Catalan population, population have parents, mother, father or both, with roots outside Catalonia. This is not an issue of a classical nationalism, but a profoundly democratic act. We do not wish to create walls with any European nation or the world. Quite the contrary. We want to work to eliminate them in practice. We will, we will not falter. I have often said that what threatens democracy is not disagreement. Indeed, democracy needs disagreements. What really threatens it, it is a lack of tools to solve disagreements democratically. We Catalans hope and trust that the political conflict over our self-determination can be resolved peacefully without war, without violence, without winners and losers, without victims and thugs. We reject all the violence used in the last century in any part of the planet to resolve political conflicts. The right of self-determination is a tool of peace, is a tool that could prevent conflicts. As Paul Casals, a well-known Catalan, reminded us in a memorable speech of the United Nations Assembly in 1971, Catalans in the 11th century met to talk about peace because at that time the Catalans were already against war. Ten centuries later, we maintain the same values to peace and harmony. So thank you, you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Some interesting uh, points for the questions and answers session raised there. I'm particularly interested in the relationship myself of Catalonia that you anticipate with the European Union. Next, we have three speakers, and uh, the first of whom is Marvin Suez, an assistant professor in the Department of Economics within the School of Social Sciences and Philosophy. He actually specifically researches politi the political economy of separatism and nationalism. And he's writing a book on Dreams of Isolation, A Global History of Economic Nationalism. And playing to form as an economist, he's going to give us a kind of his, his thoughts on the economic benefits and costs of nationalism. Marvin Suesa. Thank you, Mr. Puigdemont, for your comments. So secession is indeed often associated with uh, concerns of democracy, but it also has important economic consequences, and it is these that I will um, analyze here. So let me start off with the benefits. The main benefit of independence is probably policy autonomy, which is really just an economist's way of saying sovereignty. Now, what does that mean? It means that through separation, the citizens of a new state can potentially form a government that is more closely aligned with the democratic preferences of uh, that new country, which is what Mr. Puigdemont uh, referred to. One example of a policy in which they can seek closer alignment with their own preferences would be, for example, cultural and language policies. 
So clearly, the benefits of this are difficult to measure. But it is also clear that symbols of cultural, historic, and uh, linguistic identity, all elements of what I think may be called nationalism, hold a high value for many people, a value so high that some people in history and still today um, have given up their lives for concepts such as a nation. In Ireland, we know this Irish history shows us many examples of that. So cultural autonomy um, should not be discounted, even if it cannot be quantified. Now, another dimension, almost as important in the Catalan case, is the benefit an independent state may provide in terms of fiscal autonomy. Now, the numbers here are notoriously unreliable um, in this case, but it is quite likely that the average citizen of Catalonia is a net contributor to the Spanish central government. Now, this makes sense because Catalonia is on average a wealthier nation than um, the rest of Spain, which in a system of progressive taxation implies they pay more taxes. It also is a region with lower unemployment, which means they receive lower um, unemployment benefits. So in theory, therefore, an independent Catalan state could decrease taxes or could increase the funding for some uh, local goods. However, it is here that uh, things turn out to be more difficult in practice. Firstly, the Catalan government is indebted to a higher degree than most other Spanish regions, with the main creditor being the Spanish central government. Secondly, Catalans currently use several services, such as defense, supplied by the central government. So an independent Catalan state would need to spend more than the current regional government does to fund these kinds of services. Now, the extent of this may be relatively small in the Catalan case because the regional government already provides a large array of local services, but it is nonetheless spending that should be part of the equation. Thirdly, tax revenues are unlikely to remain constant after independence. As I will now show, this is because of the potential costs a secession would entail. Now, these costs can be divided into two categories. First of all, the costs of the independence process itself, and secondly, the costs of disintegration. The costs of the independence process itself, um, if we exclude the possibility of a violent breakup, stem from uncertainty. Uncertainty arises because we do not yet know the legal and regulatory framework that will govern Catalonia for the foreseeable future. It is this uncertainty that depresses investment and potentially consumer confidence. We also do not know the framework governing the relations between Catalonia and the rest of the world. And it is that framework that turns out to be crucial. For example, Catalonia is currently tightly integrated into the European financial architecture, partially because it uses the euro as a currency, partially because it has access to ECB support and lending. At least this support would not be available after independence which would leave the country without an important stability anchor and without an important source of insurance in case should a banking crisis arrive. Now, when it comes to currency, Catalan policymakers could, of course, choose to retain the euro unilaterally. That would solve part of the problem. But in doing so, or, for example, in issuing a currency that is pegged to the euro, Catalan policymakers would give up the ability to manage that currency. They would give up the ability to use monetary policy independently. Now, if, as I said before, part of the reason for independence is to gain policy autonomy, then this would risk undermining the purpose of the initial exercise. The economic history of Ireland 
offers a case in point here. With the Irish pound pegged to the pound sterling until 1979, the Irish economy for a long time ended up not only importing British consumer goods, but also a large share of its post-war recessions. However, the largest effect is likely to stem from trade disintegration. Currently, close to half of Catalan exports go to other parts of Spain. Of those exports sold outside of Spain, close to two-thirds are destined for EU countries. Seceding implies leaving Spain as well as the European Union and even the World Trade Organization, as a matter of fact. It will therefore involve breaking many of these trade links. This is because a newly independent Catalonia would face tariffs to enter European markets, as well as facing a different regulatory regime, both of which would inhibit trade. Now, of course, Catalan authorities could choose to follow EU regulations on all matters um, to try and ease that last friction. But once again, if the goal of independence is policy autonomy, then what is the point of doing so? As the British government is now in the rather slow process of finding out, one cannot have full access to the EU market, not be a member, and retain policy autonomy all at the same time. In line with these predictions, most empirical evidence shows that at least in the short to medium term, the measurable costs of secession tend to be severe. Analysis by two Flemish economists um, published last year shows that for the typical country declaring independence, output is still at least 20% below trend a decade later. My own work um, shows how the disruption of trade and production links cost the Baltic states about five percentage points per year in output after the exit from the Soviet state in the, in the late 1980s. And this is bearing in mind that these countries were exiting an already quite dilapidated economy. The example of the Baltic states, I think, is instructive for another reason, because we know that these states did, of course, do quite well eventually. And that is, um, stands in quite stark difference to the experience of some other post-Soviet states, such as, for example, Ukraine. Now, why that difference? Well, apart from a clear commitment to democratization and market reform, it was the ability of the Baltic countries to integrate themselves with Western Europe and Central Europe politically and economically, an integration that in their case was not actively opposed by their largest neighbor, as it was in the Ukrainian case and still is in the Ukrainian case. This brings us back to Catalonia. If EU integration is crucial to long-term growth, then what are its prospects? Well, membership applications take about 10 years and much longer potentially if met with hostility by an existing member such as Spain, which would probably exercise a veto over accession or even association. This would hold the unpalatable prospect for a protracted isolation of a newly formed Catalan state a state which would only have a small domestic market to fall back on. So to put this in perspective, the Catalan domestic market is about one-tenth of the size of the British market, where most people are already expecting quite severe disruptions to uh, GDP because of trade disruptions. Now in the Catalan case, as a small and at the moment open economy, Falling trade would imply declining export revenues, dropping domestic incomes, and falling tax revenues. Hence, my rather pessimistic outlook as to the fiscal space available to an independent Catalan government. Correspondingly, a number of companies 
dependent on the EU market, have already voted uh, with their feet and moved operations out of Barcelona to Madrid as soon as independence became a possibility in October 2017. Now, do these costs, which I have outlined here, imply that independence is always a futile endeavor? No, I don't think they do. We stand here in a country that declared independence from the United Kingdom almost exactly uh, one century ago. And Ireland has weathered the economic hardships, and there were many of them, in the decades after independence. No economist can quantify potential gains from sovereignty. But I do think that we have to be very clear and honest about the costs of exit. It is good and proper, as Mr. Puigdemont has done here, to talk about democracy and about giving the people a choice. But if we truly believe in the people's choice, then let us put all the risks on the table in um, a frank and open manner for the people to make an informed choice. As the experience of Brexit is continuing to show, wishful delusions will not change the economic realities we encounter after exiting. Thank you. Thank you for that, Marvin. That was very informative and some stark warnings for Catalonia there. And nice use of the phrase fiscal space, which strikes fear in the heart of Irish people. Um, up next, we have Michelle Darcy, an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science. She's a specialist in African politics and the political economy of development. And um, she's specifically interested in democratization in Africa and state building in Europe historically. And she's going to draw on that expertise now. Thank you, Michelle. I want to place the Catalan case in a bit of a broader historical, national, and global context by specifically looking at the relationship between secessionist conflict and the fiscal contract. So picking up on some of the themes that Marvin raised. Because this is one of the arguments that is most often put forward as being at the heart of the Catalan case, at least in the Anglophone media, and is often at the heart of many secessionist movements. The fiscal contract is really fundamental to a fair and functioning society, though it often doesn't get as much attention as issues around democracy and democratization. But it's the pact that makes everything else possible because it's where citizens agree to the rather extraordinary act of committing some of their private wealth to a public fund in return for the state's commitment to use that money for the public good. So at the heart of this contract, which underpins the social contract, are the principles of fairness, reciprocity, and consent. This contract can be breached in at least four different ways. So the tax burden needs to be shared equitably for this contract to work. Spending needs to be on goods that there is broad consensus are socially desirable and sanctioned. Tax levels need to be in line with spending levels. Um, and spending should not exceed taxation. So someone else shouldn't be paying for these services if a country is to be in a really mature fiscal relationship with its population. So the first two of these cases are really the ongoing issue of domestic politics, who pays what and what it's spent on. But the second two, where there are imbalances between levels of taxation and spending, are often uh, the conditions that provide both economic and moral arguments for secession. So I want to speak about them in a little more depth. Uh, in relation to uh, anti-colonial secessionist movements and using the Irish case as an example. So a meaningful fiscal contract never existed in Ireland in the period when it was ruled by Britain. And this imbalance between taxation and spending was most egregious in the 19th century. 
After the Act of Union, Ireland was, by the admission of the Financial Relations Commission at the end of the 19th century, taxed beyond its economic resources. So tax per capita in Ireland uh, increased over the course of the 19th century in a period when the, the economy was going through decline and periodic crisis. At the same moment when tax per capita in Britain was decreasing while their economy was becoming the strongest in the world. On the spending side of the equation, spending in Ireland was not commensurate with these perceived high levels of taxation. When great need arose during the famine, British politicians did not see it as the responsibility of British taxpayers to pay for famine relief. So they insisted that local Irish ratepayers bear this burden, sending poor law unions into considerable debt. Eight years after the famine, uh, taxes were increased again with the introduction of the income tax in Ireland, which increased revenue by 33%. And this was used to pay for the free pay trade policies that caused further economic damage to the Irish economy. There was a clear lack of fairness, reciprocity and consent in fiscal relations and this provided an incontrovertible economic and moral case for independence. These basic dynamics uh, were at the heart of many colonial, if not all colonial, uh, independence movements. Perhaps the most egregious example of an imbalance comes from the Congo, where an estimated 60% of income was taxed, but the country at independence was left with virtually no services. For example, there were only 30 university graduates. Such extreme imbalances were at the heart of the colonial project. So looking at the fiscal fundamentals, which in a way is a way of getting beyond rhetoric and propaganda, uh, helps us make clear the economic imperatives, power disparities, and racial attitudes that can underlie colonial control and the consequent rational and moral imperatives of independence movements in response. Turning from this context to the secessionist movements we see today in Europe, it seems to me that breaches in the fiscal contract are also centrally at the heart of secessionist movements, but playing out in a slightly different fashion. So when we look at Britain, Northern Ireland is heavily subsidized by England and Scotland to a lesser extent. But what is different here from the colonial context is that the fiscal imbalance is actually in favor of the regions with secessionist movements. And in some way, this is blunting the economic argument for secession. Though obviously other forms of imbalance provide a moral argument and Brexit has fundamentally changed the underlying economic calculus. In the Catalan case, as I said, and as in Marvin uh, discussed, one of the narratives we're given to explain it is this grievance that Catalonia subsidizes the rest of Spain by paying more tax because it has a healthier economy, leading to this perceived unfairness and lack of consent among certain sections of the population. And those conditions have understandably been exacerbated by recent fiscal crisis and distress. The consequence of this imbalance are not as economically ruinous for Catalonia as they were for Ireland uh, in the 19th century. Um, so the extent of the moral argument could be called into question. However, this imbalance enables uh, the economic and moral arguments to be made and therefore in some way I think needs to be addressed. A final thought from the Irish case. Independence is not a silver bullet. Ireland has never built a meaningful fiscal contract where people pay taxes voluntarily and willingly because we trust the state to provide services that we value in return. Distrustful attitudes towards the state inherited from the British period persist. Irish electorates are fundamentally unwilling to pay increased taxes. Last week, we celebrated the centenary of the establishment of, uh, of the first doll. 
I wonder, will we celebrate the centenary of the establishment of the Revenue Commissioners on the 21st of February, 1923, when we became finally financially responsible for ourselves? Independence is in many ways the easy part. Becoming responsible is much harder. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, perhaps some wise words for the Spanish government in Madrid there. And our last speaker, before we get to the Q&A section, is another political scientist, Emmanuel Komen, uh, who specializes in comparative institutions and American politics. And he's going to you know, ask tonight, is there a right to self-determination and when does it actually apply? And the word self-determination and the phrase is used a lot by uh, the Catalan nationalist movement. And um, Emmanuel will give us an overview of when and whether, whether that is an accurate um, application of it or not. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for showing up. I'm used to having like half the people here. I teach on Wednesday and Friday, so good job, everybody. Um, actually, going through the title, I realized that it may sound confusing. I'm not going to have a philosophical discussion about whether there should be self-determination, a normative, should we have that, should groups, ethnic groups, have the right to self-determination. But I'd rather take a more pragmatic view. When does it actually become fruitful? There are a lot of groups that actually do ask for self-determination. Some are more successful than others. Um, some make us more uh, sympathetic to the cause than others. When is that the case? And a good example to start from, Kosovo is an independent country, Catalonia is not. What actually, what are the things that may explain that? What are some of the differences? And to give you the punchline, I think at the end of the day is politics, geopolitics, international relations, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we have this beautiful idea about self-determination starting with Woodrow Wilson. I'm going to have some slides on that. But at the end of the day, it's still the world powers and international relations that actually dictate the success, determine the success or failure of this movement. That's my view. And to give you a tentative plan, I'm going to start with the concept itself. Started at the Versailles Treaty in 1918, associated with the US President Woodrow Wilson. Um, and I'm going to emphasize one particular uh, shortcoming of this beautiful philosophical idea that from the get-go subjected it to relations of power and international relations. And from there on, these relations of power and international relations and politics were very important for, I believe, all other movements. And self-determination has often been used by autocratic leaders, by a lot of people, because they know how it's actually applied. I'm going to uh, talk about some old application. I'm from Romania, so I'm going to focus a lot on Austria, Hungary, and Eastern Europe, but also some new examples. And I'm going to finish up with some tentative conclusions. Uh oh. Wrong way. So, as already hinted, the concept of self determination really emerges in the aftermath math of World War I. Nationalism was at its peak, or before World War I, let's say, was at its peak. And it comes in the context of many movements for independence in the Ottoman Empire, and especially in Austria-Hungary, which the dual monarchy was an odd animal in, in the sense that it was a collection of many nationalities speaking very different languages. And Willard Wilson, a very, um, very smart political scientist, probably the most famous political scientist, came out with uh, this right of self-determination, which in the very general terms means that a group of people with a certain degree of conscious, national consciousness should form their own state and choose their own government. Now, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of room for interpretation. What, does it, what are the things that would determine the group? In general, it's language. Although, in the case of Pakistan and India, it was religion, but for most, most part, it's been understood as language. 
main consequence, again, for Austria-Hungary, this is the case that I know. Uh, this is Austria-Hungary before and after the Treaty of Versailles. Big chunk goes to Poland, big chunk goes to Slovakia, Romania, uh, uh, Yugoslavia gets some part, and Italy. It basically disappears as an empire, and we have two small countries replacing that empire. To see how it works, obviously it was determined by who spoke what language in a given territory. Although some of them, as you can see, like Voivodina, I, I don't know if I can actually, this one, the distribution is actually quite equal between Hungarians and Serbs. Serbia got it because there were slightly more Serbs than uh, Hungarians. So it is, at the end of the day, whoever spoke whatever language became independent or attached to a country that was speaking the same language. Now, going to the issue with self-determination that I have. First, this national consciousness that this is a fluid concept, some may say constructed. I think I'm smarter than actually engaging in that debate here. So I'm not gonna touch upon that. But from a purely pragmatic standpoint, the biggest issue is that it does not qualify the unit of analysis. What size is the territory that we're talking about to us for this uh, independent movement? It's not mentioned in the theory, and actually it's impossible to determine. I have a slide next to actually show you uh, what I mean. It leaves room for interpretation, he left room for interpretation at Versailles, and because of that, it was from the get-go used politically. And what I mean by that, I'm from Romania, I have to tell my allegiances, so that, uh, because it's very controversial, obviously. Uh, but I am Romanian, so I, and my family and I, benefited tremendously from uh, the Treaty of Versailles, right? It's, it's really good to be part of a majority. <laughs> But what I mean by the unit of analysis, so this is Transylva Transylvania, right? The, the part in blue, where a majority of people in 1918 spoke Romania. Hey, since, uh, hence, it was given to Romania, to what at the time was the kingdom of Romania, significantly smaller. But within this region, there's another territory of three counties that are heavily Hungarian, roughly 80% of the population. Who decides that this is the unit of analysis and not this one? Within those, there's maybe a village or a city where Romanian is spoken, 90%. Who actually decides that those guys don't ask for independence? And that was left in the air because it's impossible actually to determine at Versailles. So, how was the issue solved? As I said, as I gave you, what determines the shape of the union, it's actually politics at Versailles. And put simply, the countries that lost the war lost territory. It was that simple. It was politics and international relations. Uh, now, more recent examples that actually, I think, really speak to this role of politics and international relations. Kosovo and Catalonia. Kosovo is an independent country recognized by most EU members, with the exception, of course, of Spain, Romania, Greece. I wonder why. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> but it made it. It left a country that not only that is not a EU member, it's actually struggling to become a EU member. Therefore, they had very little leverage, Serbia. Catalonia is a very different issue. And again, it's, it is not a normative talk. I stay away from those in general. This is very pragmatic. It's, it's trying, as some of my predecessors said, trying to leave a country that is a EU member. Uh, EU members do not, um, do not make any judgments about the territorial integrity of another EU member and they're not gonna do it. And to show, so this is probably 
the, uh, the punchline, it's at the end of the day politics and how you play your cards in international relations and politics. And probably the best example of politics and self-determination recent one, what is the most recent successful self-determination story in Eastern Europe? This is controversial, but it's my last slide, so I'm going to leave. It's Crimea. That was the argument used by Vladimir Putin. And obviously, no, it, it's, uh, everybody knew in 2014 that it's not coincidental that he chose exactly the moment they signal their belonging to the West to actually remind ourselves of the self-determination principle. But it was used for obvious political reasons. So play your cards. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Always good to end on a bit of controversy. Um, so the panelists, that was a really interesting um, hour of discussion. I think it's a tribute to what happens when you bring a German, an Irish woman, a Romanian, and a Catalan citizen together to discuss uh, nations and nationalism. I thought that was very broad and very interesting. So now we have about a half an hour for um, questions. Um, I'd like you to keep them short, concise, and as I said before, polite. This is not kind of the forum for grandstanding. There are a large number of people here, okay, and we'd like to get as many questions as possible um, aired. So, with that, does, could we have a first question? Gentlemen there. We don't, we don't have, just shout loudly, okay? You can stand up, it might actually. The room isn't very well constructed for mic passing, unfortunately, but Maeve will run around. Thank you, Maeve. Thank you. Um, my question is someone from Barcelona who saw the whole crisis and how it divided uh, the country or state. Um, is do you fear the referendum, if it is hypothetically legally binding, will divide the nation of Catalonia similar to how the referendum in Britain over Brexit has or the referendum in French Canada has? Thank you. Thank you. Perfect question. Nice and concise. Okay. We'll take, we'll take a second question and a third question and then we'll get some answers. Okay. No, no takers? Second question? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And the woman here, the w with the blonde hair. Yes, you. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that there are different discourses this evening, and while all very relevant, I'm not really sure or convinced how well they engage with each other. Um, it seems to me that when we try to calculate fiscal costs and other types of costs, which can be indeed indexed in different ways, they are not at all the same costs that we think about when we discuss democratic rights. So it's more a comment than a question, and I would like to have your responses. Thank you. Okay, so we have three questions there. Um, will it be divisive in Catalonia, like it has been in French Canada? Why have you been playing your cards incorrectly by having a peaceful movement? And um, really, I suppose, to summarize that woman's comment, can you really put a cost on self-determination? And, yep, go ahead. This might work. <laughs> yeah, it works. Okay. <laughs> Hey, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for all of you for your uh, point of view. It's very, that is interesting, but uh, and a pro on, um, 
economical approach or fiscal approach or ethnical approach is not enough in order to understand why Catalan people are demanding independence. Well, the case of the Can Quebec is quite different, uh, not only because the attitude from the Canada government was quite different from the Spanish one, but because um, there is a, well, a significant mm, ethnic question uh, concerning the French language there. Um, of course, uh, all the things, uh, all the important things, in case of the Brexit or in case of the Can in the Quebec, uh, create tensions and division, um, confrontation of the part of the society. For me, that is not a problem. The problem is to not find the way to solve that disagreement, because the disagreement is a characteristic of a democratic society. Always you can find disagreements in a democratic society. That is not a problem. That is the, that is the uh, in fact, is a sign of uh, the health of the democracy. The problem is when you are not allowed to solve that disappointment through the democratic means. That is the problem. And all of questions, all of questions could be uh, put on the table. For me, the unity of Spain or the unity of Catalonia or the unity of Romania is nothing sacred. It's not come from God, it's come from the human being. So if a new generation needs other and modern, more modern tools to manage their challenges, why not? Why the countries of our ancestors is the West too to manage the challenges for the modernity? That is unbelievable. So the way to solve that contradiction is to ask the people. So uh, regarding the, 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 the non-violence commitment to Catalan movement is one of the, our best arguments. The, the, the commitment to Catalan people to peace and to non-violence way is not come from now. There is centuries of experience on that. It's not causality because uh, if you can see in Barcelona, for example, the biggest demonstrations against war or allowing or demanding to allow to receive refugees from the war of Syria. It's not causality because there is a, a very deep commitment in Catalan society, in Catalan culture with nonviolence. For that, we try to resist all of provocations uh, in order to fall in such attitude. Because when we propose, let me say, a conflict, like the first of October referendum, with our tools, our language, our culture, we won. But if we follow the, the conflict as the Spanish state has designed and has decided, which means the violence, confrontation, we will lose. So we will never, never uh, use the violence or accept the violence as an uh, alternative to defend our right. Because it's time to say the right of self-determination is a tool to prevent conflicts. It's a shame for the humanity to see the only, only um, su successful projects, or successful demands uh, of the right of self-determination is thanks to violence. That is a shame. In the 21st century, that is not acceptable. For that reason, we will not follow the path of the Gilets jaunes. Uh, because we have no, 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 no one single point of relationship with that, of course. But we have shown since eight years our clear commitment to a civical and peaceful demonstrations. There, is there another country in the world who has allowed, with the capacity, to call for a big demonstration every year, every year, with more than a million people to the streets with no one single incident, not at all? That is the first case in Europe, and that must be heard. That must be respect. Finally, in the question of the fiscal, Cost and well, I'm, I'm agree with you. Uh, we must to uh, 
to explain clearly to our people the cost of independence. But first of all, now I'm very interested to know the cost of dependence. And, uh, <laughs> and because, and it's, I think it's, mm, I don't know why, I suppose yes, but the Spanish government uh, never show the figures of the, the fiscal balance between Catalonia and Spain. Never. One, one time, only. And when they see, they saw the, that uh, unequal balance means 8% of our GDP, that is very serious. No one economy could resist more time uh, losing every year 8% of its GDP for nothing. And for that, yes, we want to discuss about the cost of independence, but start with the cost of dependence. And secondly, we must not forget, no one single country who was declared independent has to be independent, has decided to remove the declaration of independence and to return to previous status quo. So, well, that, but that uh, approach is very interesting. Um, in order to remark, to stress, the Catalan case is not economical nationalist case. Because the, the economical reasons for independence in Catalonia were present 40 years ago. And 40 years ago was zero MPs demanding independence. 10 years ago, after the uh, decision of the Spanish Constitutional Court, do you know what, how many MPs were in favor of independence in the Catalan Parliament. The Catalan Parliament is formed by 135 seats. Well, in the end of 2010, only 14, 14 were in favor of independence. Four years later, we were 72. So, well, this is not economical or ethnical approach who could explain why Catalan uh, demands independence. It's about dignity. It's about dignity. All peoples, all countries, have the right to be the result of their own efforts. And that right is not respected in the case of Catalonia. Okay, I think Marvin wanted to... Um. I wanted to pick up on this uh, image of these kind of different discourses at play here. Um, and I agree with you to some extent, right? So we talk about, you know, is it nationalism? Is it all about uh, fiscal space? Is it about democracy? So what really is at the heart of Catalan independence? I think the um, presence of these discourses reflects the fact that the Catalan movement itself has gone through different discourses and emphasizing different reasons for independence throughout its trajectory over the last decades. Right? Initially, I think it is fair to characterize it as mainly a movement about language and cultural rights, so more nationalism in, as you said, a, a 19th or maybe early 20th century um, fashion. Then, mainly after the financial crisis, it went through a phase where it's all about economics. Right? So Catalonia was also very harshly hit by um, the financial crisis. There were spending cuts um, also that the uh, regional government made, which then seemed to strengthen uh, the argument that there was a, a fiscal imbalance between the region and the central government. So that then for those years after the financial crisis really um, came into focus, although I think that probably most people would uh, dispute the 8% of uh, GDP figure that uh, Gospel Trimont has uh, quoted here. And then um, following on from the, from the financial crisis, following partly the decision of the Spanish Supreme Court and um, the referendum and um, the um, reaction of the Spanish state uh, to the referendum, then the discourse changed again, the narrative changed. Right? And from then on, it was more about democracy, human rights, and dignity. So I think it is probably fair to characterize all three of these discourses as being an integral part of the Catalan movement. Okay, thank you. It seems. <laughs> thank you.
It seems I should have warned the speakers to keep their answers short. <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman with the beard here. Hello, is that okay? Um, first of all, I'd just like to say I came here to hear President Puigdemont and I've heard three other fascinating speakers who I would listen to any day. And so my question is for the whole panel, not just for the President. Um, a number of people have alluded um, that it's a, we're celebrating the centenary of our own um, beginning of the last phase of our movement to independence where a year and a week and a day ago, or a hundred years and a year, week and a day ago, we unilaterally declared independence. Nobody um, recognised us and our leaders were locked up. Sound familiar? Um, and yes, the economic arguments were to the forefront in our first meeting of Dáil Éireann, particularly the poor laws, which the Speaker mentioned, which were an awful burden on the Irish people. The question is, are an informed and educated electorate, having been told of the economic arguments and the fiscal arguments and so on, and the interdependence and the years it might take to rejoin the EU and all the rest of it, are they then entitled as mature adult voters to choose independence anyway and accept, as the President mentioned, that nobody goes back? We've had hard times over the last 100 years and there is exactly zero people who vote for a party who wants to rejoin the, the UK, because there is no such party. So the question is, after all of the warnings and all of the project fear, should the people, any educated electorate, be allowed to make the wrong decision? Do we have another question? Thank you. Oh, there's loads of questions. Uh, we'll take one from a woman. Is there a woman? We need a woman. Yes, there's a woman. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, and a third question. Anyone can take this one. Here, another. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Pitman. Uh, now you are one year, more than one year in the exile. And how does it feel uh, to be uh, far away from your home? Uh, are you angry with disappointment? And are you hoping to go home soon? Uh, I would like to know a little bit about your experience. Okay, so questions two and three and one, they're actually quite well related. So, which, who, which one, who wants to? Yes, the whole panel. Um, so are people allowed to make a wrong decision? I, yes, they are. <laughs> sure. Emmanuel, Michelle? Michelle, okay. I don't think it's about right or wrong, but as Marvin said, they need to have everything on the table. They should have everything on the table when making this decision. I don't think it's right or wrong, but the consequences should be uh, transparent. Well, um, I'm, I'm, I think um, the current society is the most informed and educated than ever. And it's not acceptable that kind of democratic paternalism, uh, that kind of relationship considering uh, the people in general with uh, no capacity to, 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 to decide uh, things, important things. Um, I think we are, we are seeing um, a changing of uh, um, the, the, the way when the liberal democracies manage the, the power. Uh, from that paternalistic point of view, the power needs to do politics for the people. But in the modern way, in, in the, under the, the fourth industrial revolution, we need to move from that point of view and to do politics with the people. Because the people is allowed to participate and to do politics without to be politician. And that is the real challenge for the liberal democracy. That is a real challenge. And uh, the, uh, um, re the digital revolution uh, is a reality now. And if Europe loses that opportunity to create its own standard to manage technology from a democratic point of view, the standard will be from Asia, from China, from the United States. That means a big brother. 
So we need people to help us, politicians, to do better things, to decide better than ever. And now technology and knowledge of the population allows to create a new model to base it from that kind of concept, politics for the people and the politics with the people. Well, um, what's next? Good question. It depends. It depends. Uh, I could answer the question saying what is my priority, what is my goal, in fact. I'm trying, even in exile, to achieve uh, with the Spanish authorities uh, a dialogue process in order to allow Catalan people to decide for themselves their own future. That is the basis. It doesn't matter the choice of the Catalan people. If the Catalan people decide to remain in Spain, it's okay. That is democracy. Then, but we have the right to be heard and to decide about our lives. It's not acceptable um, for more time to consider uh, call a referendum, to, to, to organize a referendum, a crime. It's one of the, the worst crimes in the Spanish penal code. Could I, we accept that in the European Union? No. So what's next? Democracy. Not repression. Not threatens. Not fear. De democracy. And if we start a democratic dialogue process, of course we know we will finish if we find an agreement moving our position that is normal in a, in, a, in a democratic process. But my question is, is the Spanish state ready to move its position uh, in order to achieve an agreement uh, that I think the most of European countries are waiting for, a political agreement, or not? Well, um, that question is uh, concerning my feeling to be in exile. Well, it's quite difficult for me to explain that. Um, because I'm, yeah, um, I'm a politician, and I must to continue fighting for it, my country. And if I fall in the melancholy uh, on that, that uh, sentimental approach, um, uh, I will not do the best of mine. Of course, there, there is a familiar personal consequences of that. But it's not the, the first case in my family. My grandfather was also in France after the Spanish Civil War. It was a, it was a French concentration camp uh, during the Second, uh, the second uh, World War and uh, has disappeared uh, before the end of the war. And we, we have the, the letters and we know what means the exile at that time. And that uh, offered me um, uh, courage uh, to fighting because for me, mm, the really people who uh, are sacrificing their lives are people who come from Africa, from Syria, uh, through the Mediterranean Sea and arrive in Europe and follow a wall. And is putting on the uh, concentration camp, kind of concentration camp, with his family and his child. And when we see that, we have no uh, right to complain. Uh, to, to, to say something bad of our positions. I don't know if I can succeed to, to, to explain my feel. I wake up every day thinking that is must, my last day in exile. That is not realistic, of course, but I need to fight in with that point of view in order first, I'm a Catalan living in Brussels. I want to return in Catalonia. I don't want to become a Belgian or another country's um, memberships, I want to return. And second, uh, if I could return as a free man, as I'm, am I now here, for example, that is a good news not only for Catalonia, it's a good news for Spain. Because it's a start to solve democratically that conflict. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we'll take three.
three final questions, and perhaps it might be good to hear from somebody who's a little less gung-ho on Catalan nationalism, just to kind of liven it up a bit. I'm sorry, I'm very short-sighted, so we'll take someone from the back. There's a gentleman up there. Yeah. Yeah. Shut. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Interesting question. Okay. Woman here. Okay, and one final question. Great questions there. Thank you. So, is the Europe? How are you? How's your future with the European Union? And they, you know, maybe argued that uh, they also, you know, uh, signalled to Scotland in 2014 that they would be last in the queue for membership. So that's important. What can Catalans abroad do? And how does your movement relate to the rise of populism and the far right that people are so worried about? Is it just completely divorced? Yeah. Well, I was I was very disappointed uh, because the by the European Union institutions attitude, uh, not because uh, concerning our demand for independence. Of course, we know the European Union institution will back the Spanish state, uh, uh, the, um, the state uh, attitude position. But I'm very disappointed as a European citizen because when uh, a member state are using police to beaten peaceful people, that concerns European Union institutions because we are European citizens. More than two million European citizens are demanding to vote and the answer from the European Union couldn't be the silence or regarding the other side. That is very disappointing, uh, disappointed for me. Um, yes, uh, we received a clear message from European powers saying, please do, do not nothing irreversible. For that reason, the 10th of October, I decided something very, very complicated for me. I decided to suspend the Declaration of Independence in order to allow a window of opportunity to start a dialogue process like Spanish government uh, are say, was saying to me. But that was a lie. And after that, um, the attitude from the European Union must be to send a message, a clear message to Spanish authorities, please, do not nothing irreversible. Please do not suspend the Catalan autonomy and do not dissolve the Catalan parliament, which was democratically elected. And that lack of commitment was very disappointed. Um, I'm confident with the European society. Because European society, when the fundamental values are threatened in a part of the union, feels He's in, they are threatened. For example, when the mm, fundamental uh, rights are threatening in Hungary or in Poland, um, that concerns myself. I feel concerned about that. Uh, I think there is a significant mm, 
European citizens, when they saw the images on the 1st of October referendum, uh, they don't like that face of European state member. They like, probably, they feel more close to Catalan people defending ballot boxes than the state member of the European Union beating that people. Um, it's, of course, uh, it's time for the European Union to do something. We will wait for the elections, what will be the results of uh, the movements uh, demanding the right of self-determination. We will see. But um, I think if we believe in a real, a real European Union a democratic, as a democratic project, we must do exige a clear commitment to European institutions when the fundamental rights are violated. It doesn't matter if it's in Venezuela or it's in Spain. Concerning the internationalization, um, well, um, this is the new, the new uh, era in our movement because the Catalan issue now is very well known than ever. And some, some years ago, I wrote a book uh, as a journalist um, after the Olympics in Barcelona in 1993, uh, I wrote a book about the projection of Catalonia in the international media since the beginning of the uh, uh, 20th centuries after the Olympics. And the headline of the book was Cata what? Because when I travel around Europe and people ask me, where are you from? First of all, I say, I'm from Catalonia. And the, 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 the reaction was always the same. Cata what? <laughs> well, that, that now is impossible. That kind of reaction is impossible. So Catalonia now is a de facto political subject. Uh, over that, we can cons build an interesting narrative um, for, uh, to, in order to explain better than ever uh, why Catalan people want to be independent. Um, we, we trust in people and now the social media, so the, 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 the social networks uh, allow us to uh, organize a new narrative uh, different from the big media group. If we succeed in the 1st of October referendum, was thanks to that. Was thanks to that. If we won the elections, in 21st election, uh, December elections, was thanks to that. Because the, the, all the, the conventional media were backing the pro-unionist parties. So you can use the uh, social tools in order to uh, explain better than ever when you are saying, I'm from Catalonia, uh, to uh, enlarge the knowledge, the explanation about our case to the other uh, European or uh, the other country's uh, citizens. I'm very worried about the, the, the rise of the extreme right parties in Spain. But um, the problem, um, not only in Spain, sorry, in all around Europe, that is a European uh, matter. That is a European issue. And uh, in Spain, one of the reasons that explains the rise of the Box Party, the extreme right, and clearly pro-Franco uh, dictatorship, is because we didn't broke with the Franco dictatorship. Dictatorship. <laughs> but, but it's not an opinion. No. It seems an opinion, but it's not an opinion, it's a fact. Because the king of Spain was nominated by Franco. That is not a secret, it's public. The, the Franco has decided to nominate Juan Carlos as the head of Spain once Franco dies. That is. Secondly, the, the Franco's grave, the fascist dictator, is in a public monument close to Madrid paid by public funds. Is that acceptable? No. no. And finally, there's thousands and thousands of bodies still disappear. The bodies from the, for example, as, uh, Republican soldiers, executed by the Franco's 
uh, regime, and the families are not allowed to, uh, to recuperate that bodies. That is not acceptable uh, in 2019. That shows that the regime in Spain has no broken with its, its past. So that explains the rise of the extreme right, the fascist extreme right in Spain. Thank you. Um... So we're going to have some. We will have some final comments from our other panelists, if they have any, and then we will wrap up. Because I know there are many, many questions, but uh, we do need to leave the building. Marvin. Um, so I wanted to say something about what I thought was a very important question about what is the way forward. Right? Um, so clearly, as the situation stands at the moment, both sides are at loggerheads. Right? Um, so. I think both sides uh, will need to back down in one fashion or the other. Right? It is, of course, natural that uh, Mr. Puigdemont is not going to give up on his uh, goal of independence. Um, and the Spanish state is probably not going to change its long-term objective of trying to keep Catalonia into the fold. So w what can possibly happen? Well. First of all, I think it is clear that um, the tactics that were employed by um, the Spanish central administration um, during uh, the referendum as well as after the referendum um, were morally questionable and they were also politically quite counterproductive. Right? So clearly the Spanish central government needs to back down um, on a number of these issues. And, I do hope that uh, now that the Partido Popular is not in government anymore, there is at least a window of um, opportunity for that. Um, and then secondly, I think that um, maybe the Spanish state and Spanish society has advanced more over the past 40 years than Mr. Puigdemont uh, gives its credit for. Right? So I agree that the remnants of um, fascist thought, which evidently are still part of uh, some uh, um, people's thoughts in Spain, as they are unfortunately in many other European countries, uh, are a problem. But I would not give up hope that reform within the Spanish in uh, institutions, which are still uh, to a large extent, democratic are possible. I think what is unlikely is that the um, Spanish government is going to agree to hold an independence referendum uh, over the foreseeable future. So the only way forward would be for um, the Catalan government to work within those institutions to try and create the conditions that would make such a referendum possible in the long term. Thank you, Marvin. Michelle? Yeah. I want to go back to this question of uh, are an informed, educated electorate allowed to make the wrong decision? Because in many ways, this is a key question that we all have to wrestle with today. So obviously, if you're a Democrat, you have to say yes. And if the argument is framed only in those terms, you have no option but to say yes. But if you are a liberal, you might have pause because democratic politics are increasingly bringing illiberal aspects into politics. And furthermore, if you're a cosmopolitan whose unit of analysis is not the nation state but the global community, then you have to think even more seriously about the extent to which people are allowed to do harm to themselves and to others, as we see most clearly in this country with the case of Brexit. Um, and if you are all these things, a democratic, liberal, cosmopolitan, then you're probably in the middle of a nervous breakdown, <laughs> like the rest of us. Thank you. Manuel? You have... Thank you. Final thing also about uh, whether voters are rational, whether they're informed, because that's the only question that we all got, so might as well uh, <laughs> dial on that. I know from personal experience, and I think you all agree with me, that the most irrational decisions are taken when you're hot, when you're passionate about things. And at this moment, given the reaction of the Spanish government, probably is the, not a good time for passions to actually uh, 
uh, replace rational thinking and thinking of all the p potential consequences that may come with independence for Catalonia. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just going to wrap up here. Um, this was organized at the very last moment, and that can only be done with administrative support. And I'd like to thank Maeve McGrath and Helen Murray, who did a great job of getting this together. I'd like to thank the panelists. I think that was a really interesting talk. And most of all, I'll be honest with you, I was a bit concerned coming in here this evening. I'd like to thank you for being such a temperate audience. Thank you.